Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our midweek Bible studies. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you tonight. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for being a part of our time together in teaching each Wednesday. And we are excited about our study. We're going through the book of Revelation. We're just in the beginning of this series. And it's been a great time. Dr. Beasley and I both Glad have be been sharing fasting. and enjoying this conversation, enjoying each other's um, company and knowledge of the Word of God, I respect you so highly. You, and That's you've studied Revelation for so long, it just is refreshing to talk to someone who loves the book it's, as much as I love the book. It's so, been a long you. time, and I'm grateful to be a part, to be able to share yes. with God's people. Yes. That's that's yes. the point, is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We share. learn and share we with people. We learn and we share. Absolutely. Absolutely. So welcome to each of you. Glad that you are here with us tonight. Um, listen, do me a favor. Would you please put in the chat space? If you're watching tonight for the very first time, put that in the chat space. We'd love to know that. Also, I'd love for you to let us know where you're watching from if you're not watching in the city of Atlanta. We'd love to get a chance uh, to greet you properly. We have hosts who are just here and ready to give a greeting to you and so we're just glad you're here let's bless let's ask the Lord to bless yes. this time together tonight father thank you so much for your grace yes, and for your mercy over us thank you God for calling us to this place of yes. teaching and instruction thank you Lord for father. the people who have gathered yes. around screens in living rooms yes. or in uh, bedrooms or work spaces or wherever they yes. are I thank you God for each one of them I pray that you, of course, would be the teacher tonight, and that we would hear your voice. So we are hungry for you. Open this book up to us and allow it to be rhema for our life. We pray, God, that you would speak to us clearly, effectively, as your word is taught. We submit ourselves as your students. You be the teacher. We are hungry to hear your voice. Speak, Lord. We thank you in advance for what you will do and say in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. amen and amen again. Amen. All right. Well, I want to just pause before we get into a couple of announcements. I really have to give a, two big shout outs. One is a big, big shout out to our entire cast and crew for yes. our Christmas production. It was a awesome. blessing, wasn't it? Awesome. Oh, it Ooh, was a it blessing. Was I. I don't know how many times I've sat and watched it, you know, and uh, I never watch the services, never watch the services after they're over because I just can't take my voice. But uh, hearing them and seeing them yesterday was just a blessing. It was, it dynamic, was amazing. So thank you all of you for being a part of uh, this experience and those of you that were there i know you were blessed by the time together on yesterday so we honor the lord for that and my second big shout out is this is two days after christmas and we wanted to give our team off and just have a very small one or two people here tonight that's it just enough to turn the cameras on dr bees and i would go back and forth in his lesson and that's all we were looking to do but the team just decided they wanted to come several of our team members came volunteering voluntarily two days after Christmas um, and I'm so grateful to those of you that are here tonight serving in our multimedia team if you're watching online would you please put in the chat space a big big thank you to the ladies and the guys who serve on our multimedia team tonight thank you thank you thank you thank you so to each of them we thank God for you it means the world to know that you're here helping us carry this word uh, through these airwaves into the homes of those who are receiving this Amen. Amen. Well, a uh, couple things are happening at the church this week. Um, we're having our new members graduation on this coming Sunday. Do not miss this Sunday. We're going to be celebrating all of the new members of our church uh, for the year. It's just going to be a great experience, or since our last graduation, I should say, a great experience to come together and celebrate these new members who've gone through, discover new life classes, and they're going to be walking the stage. Um, receiving something more important than a diploma or a degree. Right. They're receiving the right hand of fellowship into the local church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are honored to serve as their church family. I'm honored to be their pastor. It's just a joy to see our church growing. So don't miss this Sunday as we celebrate our new members. And then secondly, we're going to have 
three services this Sunday. The first one is at 9 o'clock, and it's going to be live and online. So at 9 a.m., live and online. The second service is going to be at 1130, and it is online only, online only at 1130. And then our last service for New Year's Eve is going to be what is traditionally called watch night service at, at 10 o'clock on New Year's Eve night. So I'm asking you to please be at two of those services on Sunday, either the 9 and the 10 p.m. or the 11.30 a.m. and the 10 p.m. And all three of our services will be streamed online, so you can catch it online at any time of those times. We know that you'll be present and that you'll be there. Um, also want to encourage you in your giving tonight that as you give, that you be faithful in giving, um, honoring the Lord's work in this local church and uh, what he does through this ministry on a regular basis. I just really want to encourage you to give uh, faithfully and generously and thank all of you that give. You have been so um, faithful in uh, remembering the Lord's tithe and remembering the Lord's church. And so I want to encourage you on Wednesdays, when you give, please know that 100% of your gifts goes directly into ministry, into outreach. Um, it doesn't go for any other purpose except right into our community, to the hands and lives of people that need them. Um, we've been meeting needs just over this uh, period of um, break for Christmas. We've been meeting needs this week as well, and our team and staff has been busy uh, supporting those needs. And I just really want to ask you to be generous uh, tonight, liberal tonight in your giving. Uh, give as if you would one day receive from this offering yourself. Give with that heart and that spirit the way you would want someone to give if you were in need of this offering. So let's ask the Lord to bless our giving and we shall receive our offering. Father, thank you. For your grace over our lives and your blessings over our life, you've enabled us to be able to give. Lord, we don't count that a small thing because we know that so many people would love to give but can't because they have nothing from which to give. But Lord, you have blessed us with jobs and careers and streams and sources of income. And so, Father, we give tonight out of that bounty. We give out of those blessings. And we ask for your favor and grace to rest upon every person, every home, every household that is sowing a seed tonight. And I pray, God, that you would return back to them a hundredfold. Hundred May the blessings of the Lord fall over their home, their house, their family in ways that money can't buy. Yes. And we'll give your name praise yes, for it God. in Jesus name. Jesus name. Amen. amen. And amen, amen again. All right. Well, as a family, let's grab our smartphones and let's prepare ourselves to give tonight. And as we are doing that, I want you to look at this video and we'll be right back ready for the word of the Lord. Praises to our God. All right, Dr. Beasley, okay, are you Pastor. ready to jump in? Yes, sir. Let's jump into this book. So we are studying tonight uh, the Church of Smyrna, Smyrna. and I want to add in the Church of Pergamos, okay. uh, these two churches together, because there is a stark contrast 
between both churches that I really want us to pick up okay. a little bit tonight. But um, I want to remind everybody of what we've said, right? And so we've said that the book of Revelation, the seven church letters, are written to these seven churches that have these seven themes to these churches' personalities yes. or these churches' concerns and issues. The church at Ephesus is the loveless church. The church at Smyrna is the suffering church. The church at Pergamos is the compromising church, Compromise. and Smyrna and Pergamos we're going to look at tonight. Uh, the church at Thyatira is the false church, and Lord knows we have some of those. <laughs> um, the church at Sardis is the dead church. The church at Philadelphia is the faithful church. Faithful. And the church at Laodicea, which corresponds to the last church age, or the church age that we believe the church is in Amen. today, and that is the lukewarm church. Not hot, not cold. Amen. It's lukewarm, and obviously it is detestable to God. Jesus says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And so these are the two churches. And as a way of reminding everybody, we also mention that these letters have a pattern to them. The way that they're written, yes, Jesus, sir. he dictates the letters to John in a pattern, and we've helped to identify the elements of that pattern, all starting with A's. And the first is the address to the church. Okay. This is to the church of, and it names the city. The second is the attribute of Christ. Which attribute of Christ does he associate with each individual church? And those attributes are pulled right out of John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 1 yes. from the Christ, from Jesus' attributes. Then there is the approval that Jesus gives to the church with the exception, of course, he has no approval for some churches, and he has approvals for all the others. And then there is accusations that he gives. He has an exception here. The church at Smyrna has no accusation. Neither does the church at Philadelphia. And the church at Laodicea has no approval. And then number five is the advice that Jesus gives to them. In light of the accusation, here is my advice to correct your behavior. And then, of course, number six is the assurance that Jesus gives, that if you are able to overcome, here is what I will bless you. Here is the reward for those who are faithful and overcome. And then the last one is the appeal. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Lord says to the church. These seven A's represent a pattern that we find in all seven of the church's uh, letters. And I think Jesus did that so that as we are going through them, we can easily see the parallel of those churches and our church or our Christian life, and it helps to structure each one of these letters. And so it's a literary tool that the master teacher uses yes, yes. to help us understand how to read uh, these individual letters. So the first one we looked at was the church at Ephesus. Ephesus. And um, in looking at the church at Ephesus, we saw the address to the church at Ephesus. It's the attribute of Christ is he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The approval to that church is I know your works, your labor, your patience, and etc. The accusation, though, that Jesus gives is you have left your first, first love. love. The advice he gives to them is to come back to your first love this way. Remember from where you've fallen, repent of your sin, and return to your first love. Repeat the first works. And then, of course, the assurance that he gives to that church is that he who overcomes will eat of the tree of life. And the appeal is he that has an ear, let him hear as it is with all of the churches. And so I want us to spend our time tonight looking at the church at Smyrna. Smyrna. The church at Smyrna, a very influential church, very unique church, um, one that I pray our churches today will identify with more than some of the other churches there in uh, the Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So I want to read this uh, section to us so we can make certain we hear the word of the Lord uh, tonight, beginning at Revelations 2 and verse 8. It reads, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. 
And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful Faithful. until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. A lot in that to unpack, a lot to unpack. From the outset, Dr. Beasley, about this church in Smyrna and Jesus' words to it, what seems to rise to your mind just from the outset of reading that section of, of Scripture? Well, one thing we said last week, Pastor, was that the letter, the letters are written to the churches. And so to be very clear with everyone, not the church, the churches. That's right. That's right. Now, we know within our churches, we have those of us who are born again and those who are not and everything in between, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. And so what really sticks out to me about this letter in particular is the acknowledgement where Jesus says, I know thy works, mm-hmm. I'm in tribulation, mm-hmm. I know what trials you're going through, mm-hmm. but I also know your poverty. Mm-hmm. Because they were in a city that was pretty prosperous. Mm-hmm. It was what we call a, a city that was given over to the arts. It had a religious theme to it as well. But if, if there were athletes, they would be probably in mm-hmm. Smyrna. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. there were individuals who were in science and medicine, mm-hmm. they would be in Smyrna. They, it mm-hmm. was a city that housed one of the, I would say, one of the earliest and, and, and greatest schools of medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the city had its prosperity. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. oddly enough, these Christians mm-hmm. were experiencing poverty. Deep poverty. As if they were excluded. From the prosperity from of the, the city. prosperity of the city yeah. yeah one of the reasons why that would happen is um, as you know they would have guilds and unions like we have a labor union today right. they had these uh, workers guilds which would be equivalent to our labor unions and to be a part of the economic guild of the city you had to worship at the temples and shrines of the uh, mythological gods of Greece. So if you did not worship these gods, you could not participate in the economic prosperity of the, of the city because your business couldn't thrive, you weren't a part of the labor union, and of course you were not respected by the Roman government because you did not participate in any of the Roman government's religion. So they were ostracized into poverty because of their faith. And that's critical to note. They would not compromise like we'll see happening with the Pergamos church. They would not compromise their faith. They would not um, be, do, have a duality of their commitment and loyalty. So they worshiped only Jesus and suffered financially they because of it. Yes. But Jesus acknowledged, I know thy poverty. Yes. But he also said, but thou art rich. Yes. Yes. If the Lord tells you you're rich, you're rich. Yes. And and that richness is, is, it's so much more than materialism. It's so much more than having a dollar or a coin with Caesar's image on it. It's so much more than that. You know, you can, you can live in the faith in such a way that material things really become meaningless Mm -hmm. to you because you live at such a higher level. Mm -hmm. You live at such a higher purpose. You live live for eternity. Yeah, money doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I think the biggest indictment of the modern day church Mm -hmm. is we are so wealthy Mm -hmm. that we have made money, financial prosperity, We've made the desire and love for money a God. 
and we begin worshiping at the shrine of things and wealth and prosperity. Back in the, in the late 80s and the 90s, the rise of the prosperity you know, doctrine started happening. And the rise of the prosperity doctrine basically said, if you have faith, then you'll be rich. I mean, and it made, no, it made no mistakes. It made no bones about it. It was very clear and straightforward. If you have faith, you should be rich. And if you're poor, something's wrong with your faith. And they did the same thing for healing, the same thing for all of these material and external um, kinds of blessings. And wealth and money was equated to spirituality. And it started, it had this massive rise in the late 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, this massive rise where we just left what the scripture says completely about money, about things. It says that gain and godliness are not the same not the thing. Same. The love of money is the, the root, root of all, all evil. evil. Now, not money is not the no, root of evil. The love of, the love of it. it. Yes. The love of it. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon. Mm -hmm. The things money brings, the things money buys for you, the power that you get from money. This church was in a wealthy city, culturally rich city, educated city, city of great commerce, a city that had, um, had the intersection of cultural icons there. You had your arts and your literature, just as you mentioned earlier, and they could participate in none of it because of their witness of Jesus Christ. And, and just imagine if, if this church, Smyrna, was the focus today. I wonder how the modern church would receive or perceive the saints at Smyrna. You know, most recently, I believe it was today, my wife and I were having a conversation about someone trying to, uh, to one of us, those of us who preach the word, mm -hmm. teach the word, trying to say that Jesus was rich materially. Yes, yes, yes. I hadn't found that anywhere in Scripture. <laughs> Just the opposite in That scripture. Jesus was rich materially. Just the opposite in I scripture. know he walked in faith and God Absolutely. met every need that he had. Absolutely. But I have not found anywhere in Scripture. He had to pay his taxes out of the mouth of a fish. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a that rich that's person. That's not a rich man to me. <laughs> um, he said, foxes have holes, holes. birds of the air but have the nests. the son of man has nowhere, nowhere to, to lay, lay his, his head. head. He had no home mm -hmm. and no dwelling. He stayed at the, uh, at the generosity of people who would receive him. He wasn't rich. And the scripture says that he became poor. That's right. Now, let's make sure we understand. It says he became poor. He didn't divest himself of all of his deity. No. So no, how no. did he become poor? Mm. Think about what that. Poverty what poverty could did he, he possibly experience? have had if we know that he did not lose the poverty of de a deity. deity? He was God. That's yes, right. Yes. So he became poor that we might be rich. He yes. experienced a natural poverty. That Remember, we might have a spiritual that wealth. That we might have a spiritual wealth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we gotta, we've got to understand that wealth has its place. But we've been so westernized. Oh, we have. That oh, we think we that wealth is the end all be all. Yeah. And that if it doesn't yeah. exist in our account, yeah. in our churches, then we must yeah. not be the going thing. As you read the progression through the book of Revelation, you find power, wealth, mm. money are major players in the apocalypse, major players in the great tribulation, major players in the final judgment. I would even venture to say there would be no revelation if power and money were not on the throne. That's what God is judging. He's judging the power, the economic power, the geopolitical power, and the religious power, and how they're all in bed together. The church feeds off the power of the world, and the world feeds off the hypocrisy of the church, and the two of them come together. That's the book of Revelation. And he's judging us because we worship yes. those things instead of him. Yes. We worship power. We worship wealth. Oh, yes. We wor worship materialism. We oh, yes. worship our oh, yes. things, oh, yes. and we've placed them on the throne and dethrone God. And dethrone God. There are people who will actually believe that God has forsaken them or God has deserted them if they lack, if they don't have, if they experience trials, if they have financial troubles. 
Uh, you talked about this church, how would it be received if it were in the modern culture today? We kind of get an answer to some of that because when the church is not financially prosperous, I'm not talking about the church itself, but the people in the church. church. When it says that they are poor, it didn't mean that the church's bank account was poor. It meant the people in the church were poor. Obviously, the church's bank account was poor. If you had a church like that in the, cur in the culture today, many people would feel like they have been done wrong by God because of the financial sufferings that they have to go through. Few people see suffering and, and spirituality together. Few see suffering and their faithful witness of Christ in the same capacity. And this church suffered um, greatly financially. As a matter of fact, a part of the history of the church uh, that we'll see uh, started in 600 B.C., uh, history of the city, rather, in 600 B.C. by King Aliates. I know I said his name wrong, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but this king in 600 B.C. was the father to a famous king named Croesus. And King Aliates and Croesus both established, on this in Smyrna, they both established coinage. They were the ones who brought coinage into our modern culture, putting an image on a coin. This is a picture of one of those coins, one of the early coins of King Aliatis. The idea is that they were so wealthy and so rich that they were able to establish their own bartering system where they made gold and silver coins. Instead of you bartering an item for an item, you now could barter based upon some unit of weight and some standard of commerce. Um, and this shows the wealth of the city. Now, uh, Aliitis came and destroyed Smyrna, destroyed Smyrna completely in 600 B.C., and destroyed it, and his son, Croesus, built it back up again, yeah. built it again, uh, and it lasted until Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great came and brought Grecian culture to Smyrna, this wonderful rich culture that you spoke about earlier, all of the arts, all the literature, and all the, so all the educated erudite people lived in Smyrna. Smyrna. All the people who had um, wealth lived in Smyrna. It was considered as one of those vacation spots and one of those areas you go to when you retire and you're doing well. That was what Smyrna was. And here you have this poor, impoverished church being persecuted greatly in Smyrna because where there is great wealth, there is always great temptation. Yeah. Where there's great wealth, there's always great temptation to abandon the faith and walk away from the faith. And that's what transpired in Smyrna. We, we, we do know one of, the famous, um, one of the famous martyrs of Smyrna is Bishop Polycarp. Yeah. Bishop Colicarp tells a story, he's 80 some years old, some have said older than that, and uh, the uh, Roman soldiers are coming to arrest him because Polycarp would not burn incense to Caesar. He wouldn't burn incense and call Caesar Lord. He said Jesus is Lord. Polycarp was a student of John, the person who wrote uh, this book. And when Polycarp is standing in his house, as they come to arrest him, and they take him, arrest him, and tie him to a stake, mm. and threaten to burn him alive, and all he had to say was, Caesar is Lord. That's all he had to say. He's recorded of saying, of saying these words, 80 and yeah. six years I have served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched, but you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared wow. for the wicked. Yeah. He said that in 156 A.D. You know, it's amazing how Smyrna has a history of going through <laughs> earthquakes and uh, declines, yes, yes. trouble, yes, trials yes. as a city, yes. but then it always it comes... It comes back even today. Smyrna is the modern uh, city of, uh, what is it called? 
Ismir. Ismir. In Ismir. That's so great. It's, it's a modern That's city. Right. So even yes. after thousands of years, all of the yes. trials that it's gone through, isn't at all. It keeps it keep rebirthing, rebirthing, resurrecting. It comes back. It's the only city of the seven cities that still exists today. Wow. It's wow. the only one that exists today. Ephesus exists in some different terms, mm -hmm. but Smyrna is the only one that exists in its original context, having a continuity of government after having fallen and risen, fallen, fallen and risen, fallen and risen, which is why Jesus... Yeah makes the attribute that he gives to Smyrna. Here, here he says in, in verse number eight to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these things says the first and the last, look at what Jesus says about himself, which was dead and is alive. Smyrna has gone through death, death. rebirth. Death, death that's right. rebirth. Jesus says, I can connect. I can relate to the deadness and the liveness, the deadness and the liveness of Smyrna, because I too was dead and I am alive. Smyrna gets its word, as you know, Smyrna from myrrh, myrrh. the myrrh, the myrrh plant, the myrrh uh, fragrance, the same fragrance that the, one of the wise men brought to Jesus, and the same fragrance that was used at his burial. Yes, myrrh was shipped from Smyrna to Egypt to help embalm the pharaohs wow. so that the pharaohs could stay embalmed and stay fresh so they could live after death in the afterlife. And myrrh, <laughs> that comes from a sap. Mm -hmm. And you don't get the myrrh unless you crush. Yes. You got to crush. Yes. You have you to crush, crush the, plant the plant in order in to order get to the myrrh get it. out. And so Smyrna is just a, Gone through a, crushing, a crushing over and over yeah, and, and so over again. It, it, it should not surprise us that the saints there yes. are going through a crushing. Yes. But yes. a crushing of not to death. Yes. But a crushing yes. to life. Yes. You cannot be in the faith if you are not willing to go through a crushing. Yeah. Mm. There's... Our faith is characterized by suffering. Our, our Lord, our master suffered. His victory was in suffering, not his victory in overcoming the Roman Empire, overcoming, you know, Pilate and Herod. His victory was on the cross. That's it. We, we worship a king who died and rose again. Rose again. Many people don't understand that Christianity has its genesis, its origins out of pain. There is a virgin birth of a poor girl in a poor, impoverished city in Nazareth, which is un overlooked by all the other cities of Judea, a um, son of a carpenter who comes into the faith, who comes into his ministry, leads 12 men who are all poor and have nothing except maybe Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> you have poverty, 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 one behind the other, fishermen, uneducated men, men who are not elite, not respected, not in the um, aristocracy. These are men who are poor and have little to nothing. That's the faith we serve. How do you go through a faith of poverty, a faith of suffering, a faith of trial and tribulation, and not expect to go through any yourself? Jesus said that if I'm your master mm. and I'm going through mm. and I'm persecuted. The world hated me. They hate me. What, do you, what should you expect yes. the world to do yes. toward you? Yes. And we should... Let this mind yes. <laughs> be, in, <laughs> be us. in us that was also yes. in Christ Jesus. Yes. Yes. And he tells us in Peter, and I love Peter. He says, don't think it's strange. Concerning the fiery trials. Concerning trial. the fiery trials that are going to try you. Yes, yes. But rejoice. Rejoice. Because it's, it's in the trials that the yeah. spirit of glory yeah. and the spirit of God rest upon you. Rest upon you. Oh, my Some God. Some people say, I want to experience God's glory. I want to experience his spirit. Do you? That's, that means you want to experience you, his trials. You got, you, listen. Hmm. And, 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 and it's not to say, and this is important, an important point to make, it's not to say 
that trials and tribulation in and of themselves make you better. No, they don't. No, they don't. It, matter of fact, it actually says, if any man suffer, let, let him, him suffer as go. a Christian. It, it is the trials we go through because of, of our faith. faith. That makes us better and stronger. When James says, count it all joy uh, because of the troubles and trials and temptations that you suffer, he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Not the trying of your job or the trying, you know, of your friends or you got folks who don't like you. That, not that kind of trial. The trial of your faith. Not many Christians have a faith that is so overt, that is so obvious, mm. that is so public, that they would be tried for it. Yeah, and think about the, the, the three Hebrew boys when they were tossed into the fiery furnace and the person who tossed them in. Mm -hmm. That person didn't even go in the fire but was burned as a result as of, a tossing, result them of tossing them in. Mm -hmm. But why were they not burned? Mm. Because it wasn't the fire. Mm. It was he that was in the fire mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. He was the one who made it so that they went through the fire mm -hmm. and they were not burned. See, I often tell people, Pastor, you're going to have trouble whether you're saved or not That's saved. That's right. It's just, it's, it's, it's the price you pay for That's going right. through the earth. That's right. For living in the world. That's right. The question is, the question is, are you going to get better mm. or bitter because of your trouble? Yeah. And the only way, mm. the only way we get better is because mm. the Lord is in the midst of the trouble with us. So if I wasn't saved today and I knew I was going to have trouble, I would want to know what can I do to better my circumstances. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I want yes, to know yes, who yes. this Jesus yes, is. Yes, yes, I want to know, do yes, I need yes. to accept Christ? Because yes. you're going to have trouble. Yes, 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 yes. But it's amazing. Yes. It's amazing yeah, yeah. how trouble with Jesus mm, is, is no trouble at all. It's no trouble it's at no all. It's no trouble at all. You, your, your faith is tested. And when your faith is tested, yeah. you have to have a rock that you stand on. Yeah. There are people who have no rock that they stand on. There's no fourth man in the fire. Mm. There's no conviction that they hold to when the lions are threatening them or they're at the Red Sea. All of the trials that we read in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, all the men and women who have suffered compiled in Hebrews 11, that yeah. hallmark of faith. The Bible says that they were sawn asunder. They suffered they went through the elements. Yeah. They, they suffered under great pain, great struggle, great trial. But yet they did not lose their did faith. Not. And notice what, God, what Jesus said to the church at Smyrna. The only thing he told them when he told them they would have tribulation 10 days, some of you would. The only thing he said was, be thou faithful. Until the end. Until death. That's it. That is all he told That's them. It. Be faithful. That's it. He never said he was going to deliver them out of it. <laughs> he never said he was going to miraculously rescue them. And sometimes we get miraculously rescued. Of course. That's... And then other times we don't. The, 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 the great dichotomy of the apostles is between Peter and James. James was sawn asunder yeah. in Acts. He was sawn cut in half, sawn asunder. Peter was in prison at the same time that James was martyred. Peter in prison, church prays for Peter, angel comes, delivers Peter from the prison, but James, just a few days earlier, gets his head chopped off. He gets sawn asunder. And many have said, why did God why did God save Peter and not James? Did he love Peter more than he loved James? Did he have um, more affection for Peter than he did James? Nothing of the sort. Nothing. It's not that he loved one over the other. His plan for one is different than his plan for the other. What he has destined for one person to receive is different than what he's destined for another to receive. He may have for you a blessing, great blessings, great prosperity. He may have for me great trial and great trouble. 
It's not a matter of him loving you more than me. We each serve a unique purpose in the overall plan of God. My suffering brings him glory. Brings him glory. Your prosperity brings him glory. It's not about us. It's about him. And he is wise enough to make that distinction. To make the di distinction and to structure your life, my life, and everyone else's life in such a way that it maximizes the glory that he gets. Yeah. He knows exactly yeah. how much prosperity to give us, mm -hmm. how much poverty to allow in mm -hmm. our lives, how much health to allow, mm -hmm. how much sickness to allow. Yeah. Nothing is beyond his control. Mm -mm. He is God. He is God. But he structures our lives yes. so that ultimately yes. he receives yes. the glory. All of the glory of goes it. back to him. All the glory for our lives, all the glory for our struggles, yeah. our pain, oh. our joys, our victories. Mountaintop, he gets the glory for that. Yeah. Valley experiences, he gets, the glory. he gets the glory for that. He's no less God on the mountain than he is in the valley. He's no less God in the valley than he is in the mountain. And, and that's why he wants us to be faithful. Can we just talk about what it means yeah. to be faithful? Yeah. To be faithful when you're going through, yes. to be faithful yes. when you're being persecuted. Yes. You know, sometimes we talk about, well, I don't have enough. You know, I, I, as I read this, I thought it said that, it, Jesus said that the devil shall cast some of you. Sometimes I think we blame every situation on the devil. Yeah. Some things are just a part of life. And some you know, things we did ourselves. Uh, some things we did ourselves. You know, refrigerators break down, you got to buy a new one. It doesn't act, no, often ask, do you have enough money in the bank account in <laughs> no, order to buy a new refrigerator? It normally breaks down whenever you, right. when you don't have enough that, in the account. Those are just trials. But whether it be a life trial or a satanically driven trial, yeah. like Satan actually yeah. persecuting someone because of their faith or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. There's sometimes there's a there's a, I like to look at it as the gap, and I think I've heard you say it as the gap. You know what we where we are, our current reality versus what the scripture promises. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's your faith through that until that reality yeah, the changes. The gap between where you are and what the scripture promises yes. for your life, that gap has to be filled with faith. Faith. One of the ways I look at it, people want to know, is it the devil that's, that's, that's doing this? Mm. Is this life that's doing this? Is this God that's doing this? And I say it depends upon how it impacts your life. Mm. If this trial impacts your life to pull you away from God, to lessen your faith, to lessen your convictions about God, if this trial is damaging your faith, then Satan's Satan. Satan, yes. If this child is, if this trial is building your faith, then God, God allowed, allowed it. it. If this trial can be traced back to something you did or something, something you said, then it's a matter of life and choices. And understanding the impact that it has to our faith. But let's get back to this okay. text here. It says. It says, these things saith he, the first and the last, verse 8, which was dead and is alive. Jesus is relating to the, the history of Smyrna with his own life and ser serving in parallel with him being dead and now alive to Smyrna constantly being dead and coming alive. He says, I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I want to zero in on the word tribulation. The word tribulation for just a moment. Tribulation comes from, it actually comes from a picturesque Greek word. And the idea is laying down on your back, laying flat on your back on the ground and having, having weights placed on your chest. Stone weights placed on your chest. And the more it places on your chest, restricts your breathing. That's called tribulation. Tribulation, tribulation it sucks the air out of you. you. It restricts your ability to move. These weights and burdens that they had to carry were these. Number one, it says poverty. Poverty was their burden to carry. There was a, there was a glory in their poverty. The fact that they could be poor and rich internally was a statement of their character and the virtue of their life. 
He says, poverty is one, but you're really rich. And then he says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are the Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. They had to wrestle with an insincere profession of their persecutors. They were being persecuted by Rome and by the Jews. Double persecution. Rome persecuted them in terms of political um, and governmental persecution. And then the Jews persecuted them because of their religious convictions of Jesus Christ as Messiah, and Jews didn't receive that. And the Jews were doing in Smyrna what they were doing in Colossae and Galatia and in Ephesus in trying to convince new converts to convert back to Judaism or to keep the laws of Moses. And he says that these people who are trying to get you to keep the law in legalism, he said they were of the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue. Synagogue is a learning spot. It's a learning school. He says that they were learning Satan's work. Wow. And, and, and who were these Jews? They were not just strangers. Mm -mm. These were family members, yes. neighbors, yes. individuals that they were familiar yes. with that yes. had basically shunned and denied them yes. because they chose yes. to believe and trust in yes. Jesus Christ. They were rejected. They were ostracized. Mm. They, were, they were criticized and judged because of their commitment to Christ. Yeah. There are, there are churches that get into legalism and we try to put burdens on people, these tribulations, weights on their chests, mm -hmm. burdens on people to keep laws that Jesus, Jesus never said. And we, we, you know, I remember when I was coming up, <laughs> you know, in, in some of our churches, we couldn't do anything. Like that's right. We couldn't go to the movies. movies. You know, women couldn't wear makeup and pants and all these other kinds of silly things, legalistic things. But those things were silly, and we grew out of them and understood that they were not in the scriptures. And I believe they were good people. They intended. They intended well. They intended well. But this is not that. Yeah. This is a more sinister, yeah. a more wicked distortion of the gospel. Yeah. This is turning the gospel into profit, turning the gospel into cultural uh, nuances and norms. This is more sinister. When I look at the modern church, I'm, I shudder because I don't see a lot of the gospel. I see a lot of everything else, but not the gospel. And people feel like if I am not in this trend, or this fashion, or if I'm not in this, you know, hip, and that's my little word because I'm old, but this hip church or this hip trend, or if I don't do it this way, then I'm not a good Christian or I'm not a trendy Christian. And now popularity and celebrityism drives the faith. Synagogue of Satan. It's, it's so important for us as believers to understand that the only way these individuals can convince you that you're wrong if you follow Jesus and that that's the wrong thing is that you've got to be pulled away mm -hmm. from the truth of scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately we live in a time now wherein uh, the average person doesn't read the Bible. So you throw an idea, a philosophy, a belief, uh, a thought that is anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. Most, many people don't have the, the, the spiritual disposition or the training, the scriptural training to identify that that is against Christ mm -hmm. and everything that he stood for. Yeah. So how do we, what's our responsibility, Pastor, yeah. to ensure that in this church, in our churches, that we train individuals, we teach the word, we teach the gospel right. so that 
people can believe the gospel right. and so that faith can be increased because faith comes by hearing and hearing by, by the, the word, word of, of God. God. What is our responsibility? Do what we're doing tonight. Teach the truth. Preach the truth. There has to be a, a consistent um, teaching of scripture without compromise. Yeah. And it's not popular. It's, 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 it's not trendy. It's not fashionable. But it's the truth. You know why it's not? Because we want, we don't want to deal with the poverty yeah. of being ostracized. Yeah, the of criticism, the persecution. Criticized of being persecuted yeah. because we want it all. Yeah. Somebody told us we should have it all yeah. and we want it all. And we have neglected the truth of Scripture for the lies of culture. We've made it now, we've made it now where the, the word of God is watered down. Mm -hmm. It's watered down in such a significant way that people will espouse all of these ideas about the Bible and about theology and never base them on the word of God, never look in the word of God. They've made themselves their own truth. Yeah. And we become a truth under ourselves. We even say it, my truth and your truth. There is no absolute truth. When you start taking away the landmarks and moving the pillars, the building is going to fall. Of course. When you break the foundation, the building is going to fall. What we're doing is we're teaching a doctrine that is not of God. It's anti-Christ, as you said earlier. This doctrine, not of God, and we're teaching it. Not teaching it verbally only. We're modeling it. We are demonstrating it. People are seeing it. There is, as I said, this celebrity culture, this common contemporary culture, this watered down message, this light teaching. Don't offend anybody. I don't want anybody to, I don't want to talk about sin because if I talk about sin, people get offended and they leave and they won't stay. All of that, the Bible says, is a teaching, a synagogue. Of Satan. Yeah. It's a synagogue. It's a place of teaching. Every time you turn on the television and there is a minister or church or ministry on it, that's a teaching. Every time you look at a, uh, a superstar who says, I'm a Christian, that's a teaching. teaching. There's so many uh, superstars and celebrities who have, who have um, had stints. I call them stints <laughs> in the faith. They didn't stay in the faith. They just had a stint in the faith and watch how the world flocked after them when they had their stint in the faith. I mean, I could name, I won't, I won't do that, but you know them. Uh, they, they come up with a Christian song or a Christian album or they make some Christian overtures in their, in, in their music or their acting or whatever have you and the world thinks that's what Christianity is. And now we've got, we've got, We've got celebrities, we've got actors, actresses, and musicians, and rap artists serving as our prophets, yeah, yeah. as our preachers and teachers. This is what it meant by synagogue of Satan. Mm -hmm. It says, these are the burdens, right? Poverty, insincere profession, people who say they are Jews and are not, in our case, say they are Christians and are not. And then this third one is, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast you into prison that you may be tried and you'll have burdens on you for 10 days. Prison, prison. Now, they were cast into physical prisons. Um, that doesn't equate for people in the Western culture. We don't go to prison for our faith. In the Eastern culture, many of them do. In China, uh, Christians in China, Christians in the Middle East can be imprisoned and can be killed, killed because of their faith. And the Western culture is not so much. But the prison is not just a physical bar. Yeah. The prison is the prison of, of, of the heart and the mind. The culture itself imprisons us. People ostracize Christians. People laugh at Christians. I mean, man, the whole, the whole political movement is anti-Christian. Um, when, you, when you take a stance for your faith, you are going to be ridiculed because of your faith. You're going to be pushed and marginalized to the side because of your faith. All of that 
is what the scripture is teaching, that we see this happening today. It's very prevalent. And as believers, we have to, and those of us who are in a position to teach and to train and to lead and pastors and others, we have to really help the body of Christ, the congregation, yeah. to really understand yeah. that there's, there's no promise that you're not going to have trouble. Yeah. No. But you still need to be faithful. You have to be. You, you got to be faithful to who he is. People that are not faithful, and faithfulness is, is doing the right thing yeah. consistently without need for recognition. Without it. There are people who give up on God, walk away from the faith, mm -hmm. um, have a struggle with maintaining their faith in trouble because they don't expect to suffer if they are a child of God. Yeah, they, they've gotten, the teaching has been so... Synagogue of Satan. Yeah. Synagogue, they've been taught, if you're a Christian, you ain't gonna suffer. Yeah. And if you're suffering with God, what did you do wrong? Yeah. Remember the yeah. disciples when they, they, they were walking oh, down the street and so, saw the man born blind? Know they said. knew he was born <laughs> blind and they said, Jesus, didn't care about the man and healing him or helping him. They just said, who sinned? That's right. Him or his parents that he was born blind because their whole idea, their whole idea of righteousness and godliness is wrapped into if you are right with God, you should not have any suffering. Yeah. And Jesus said, neither. <laughs> the man didn't sin and his parents didn't sin to cause this. He is in this condition so that the glory of God, God yeah. could be revealed through him. And that's what Christians are missing today. We want it easy and we want it nice. We want it simple. We want to have it uh, happy and all to be well. That's not our faith. Yeah, we don't want to be crushed. Mm -mm. We don't want that mm -mm. oil and, 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 mm -mm. and, and, and that fragrance mm -mm. and that anointing mm -mm. because it, it mm -mm. will come. Yes. But you've got to go through a crushing. There's a pain associated yeah. with the blessing of that great, anointing and blessing of God. There's a pain associated with that. But the good news is, yeah. though, that it says, it says, fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Verse 10, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation. Here is the good news. Yes. Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. A definite period of time. A definite period of time. God knows how long we will there suffer and when it will be over. <laughs> God knows the start date of our trial right. and the end date of our trial. And you will not suffer. Here's a, you will not suffer a day longer than you were supposed That's to. It. He will rescue you. The, the, the aspect of 10 in the, in the book of Revelation throughout the scriptures is important. Numbers mean something. Yes, you know, three has meaning and seven has meaning. 10 has a meaning as well. It's a whole number. It's where we repeat back over mm -hmm. our numbering system again. One, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, 10. Then you start again. One to three, that goes to 20. And again, so it represents a whole, complete, full. When the whole is finished, finished complete. then your suffering is done. Is Jesus on the cross saying it is, is finished. finished? I went through it, suffered, and now it's finished. God never puts anything on us that we can't bear. What does James say? He that goes through it in a trial... You, you, you maintain your faith. Mm. Let that trouble, let mm -hmm. that trial mm -hmm. have its perfect work. Yes, yes. That you may be perfect yes. and entire, lacking, lacking nothing. nothing. So, the, so, the trial, so the trial is working, working. for us. The trial is producing is. something in us. And, and what we've got to do is be committed to the process. Yes. Committed yes, to the process. Yes, yes. With the right attitude. Yes. We've got yes, to be joyful. Yes. The scripture tells us. Yes. To do it with joy. Yes, yes, yes. The scripture tells us that we should pray. Yes. We should praise God. Absolutely. We should worship. Be committed to the process. Why? 
because of what we know. We know. And James says that verse, that, that, that first word of the next verse says, knowing no, this. this. That's it. You, you, you'll flip out. You'll get frustrated. <laughs> you'll, you'll pull your hair out. You'll, you'll be depressed and confused and angry if you don't, don't know. know something. The knowledge is a power. It's power. <laughs> You have to know. But when you know this too shall pass, this, too shall pass. this has a purpose. That purpose is to honor God. Honor God's in charge of this suffering. It won't be a day longer than it's supposed to be. And God's not going to cut it off early. He's going to let me go through the full weight of it. And it is going to produce for me yeah. a character. Yes, that's it. A character. He's, it's going to develop me into the person that God has created me to be. Yeah. When you know that, then you count it all joy. You can count it all joy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it says, it says, fear none of those things that you may be tried and you will have tribulation 10 days, but be thou faithful unto death. Yeah. This unto is the word here in Greek, until. It says, be faithful even until the time of your death. If this kills you, don't quit. That's it. <laughs> if this kills you, don't stop. If this kills you, don't turn around. You got to have the kind of faith that perseveres even to death. Yeah. Yes. And if, if God is in you, mm. guess what? Yes. You're going to persevere. You're going to persevere. That's, that's, that's an indicator that your faith is real. And that you're truly saved. That you're truly saved. Mm -hmm. Because those of us who have the spirit of God in us, mm -hmm. greater is he mm -hmm. that is in us mm -hmm. than he that is in the world. You are going to win. That's why it says, and he that overcometh. Mm -hmm. It's like he's saying the expectation is mm -hmm. you're going to overcome. Mm -hmm. And because you are going to overcome, you won't be hurt by the second death. You may die, but the second death won't hurt you. Now, you're going to get into the, the first, second death. We'll we, 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 we get into that. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. The first death might get you, but right. the second, second death, death never will. In other words, you are victorious right. for all eternity. That's right. That's right. That's you're right. secure, victorious. For, for ever, all eternity. Forever. Sealed. Yeah. Is what the scripture says. He says, and, and I love it because he says, and I will give you the crown of life. Yes. Now, this is interesting here because he's talking about death. He's talking about being faithful until death. death. He's saying you'll be cast in the prison. You'll be persecuted, tribulation, going through a martyr, all the death, yeah. death, 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 death. He says, but if you can overcome it, if you can survive it, if you can last through it, I'll give you a crown yeah. of life yeah. where you'll never die again. Never die again. Never die again. There is no death to the believer. The believer, believers don't die. <laughs> we, we don't die. Yeah. He has reserved for us life. The word here for life is, yeah. is the Greek word that represents everlasting yeah. life. It's zoe. It's that it's an everlasting Ever life. Lasting. It's not about how long we live, it's right? It ain't about how long. It's about the quality. Yeah. Of your I like life. what John, I believe, the 17th chapter says, and this is life eternal. Yes. That they might know you. Yes. Eternal life. Yes. Just knowing who this he is. This is life eternal. This is life. Yes. Knowing him, experiencing yes. him, yes. having a relationship yeah. with him as you'll get into yeah. Revelation. Yeah. As we journey toward the city of God, seeing him face to yes, face. Yes, yes, oh, yes, yes. And just yes. all eternity experiencing who he is. A fullness a of his fullness presence. fullness of his presence. Understanding him in the fullness of yeah. his being. I was talking to my son yesterday. And he's into this Bible studies. I love that he's, <laughs> awesome. he's, he's digging into this word. Man, I love that. And Brandon was saying, he was asking, so what, you know, when you get to heaven and you're going to be judged, if you're already going to heaven and you're a Christian, you're going to heaven, why are you going to be judged? What, you, what is there to be judged for? Now, and I don't, I don't know if I did a good job of explaining it to him, but I, what I was trying to explain to him is the judgment for the believer is not yeah. about going to heaven or hell. We know we're going to heaven. Yeah. It's about what kind of quality will that eternal life be? Because now you have a fully glorified body. Yeah. There's no sin. There's no desire to sin. And your mind understands God in all things. All things. 
perfectly. Yeah. He says, you will know even as you, you are, are known. known. Yeah, that's awesome. With that kind of knowledge and knowing him as we're going to know yeah. him, all you're going to want to do is worship him. Uh -huh. And it won't be boring. People are saying, no. you know, worship forever. You're going to learn so many new things about this inexhaustible God. Yeah. You know, yeah. we'll get into chapter four with that. But he's inexhaustible. And you'll learn something fresh and new about God, and you'll worship him for that. And then you'll see something new about God, and you'll worship. He is infinite, infinite. in his being. Mm. Now, this crown that we wear is a crown of that kind of life, everlasting, zoe, full knowledge life yeah. that we wear on our heads yeah. in our royalty with our king. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know if we can Hallelujah. put it into words. Hallelujah. The things that God has prepared yes. for those yes. that overcome. Yes. That yes. overcome through the blood Eyes of the Lamb. Eyes had seen, ears had heard. heard. It's, it's just amazing. Yes, yes. And I would just say, you don't, in, no one in their right mind, in their right mind, wants to miss eternity mm -hmm. in the presence of God. Uh-uh. No, no. In the presence of God. Not in your right mind. Not in the right in, mind. <laughs> even the atheist, you know, and that's, we got we to gotta end. <laughs> but even the atheist who says there is no God, mm. they say there is no God. And when you ask them, what do you do if you get to heaven and find out that there was? Every single one of them says, well, I needed more evidence. I would have believed mm. if I had the evidence, the proof or whatever they need. But it's the fact that I would have believed yeah, yeah. because I desire this ontologically on the inside. Yeah. Here's the blessing, and then we're, we're done. We're done. It says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Yeah. When we get to chapter 19 and chapters 20, we're going to talk about the first death, the second death. This second death is a death of perdition. It is a death of destruction. Uh, that is reserved for those who have rejected Christ as their Savior. That's right. He says that you won't be hurt of that second death. For us, I see this not only eschatologically in the end, but I see this in a contemporary <laughs> context as well. There is a second death, a destruction that the enemy is always yeah. seeking mm -hmm. to bring. You ever had, you know, you live, you're saved and you're yes. born again, but you feel defeated. defeated. You feel like you've just been beat up by Satan. So many believers live defeated lives. It's that, that death of destruction. It's that yeah. destruction of your joy. Yeah. It takes away your peace. It robs you of your confidence in God. You can't even pray because you, you got so much weight on you. Yeah. He says, if you can overcome. Overcome. You know, Pastor, hurt. I was thinking similarly that as we go through, it says, be faithful unto death. And I was thinking, I need to be faithful until something dies. Mm. Maybe my will has to die. Mm. Maybe a relationship has to die. Yeah. Maybe an opportunity that God didn't want me to take advantage of has to die. Faithful until it dies. I got to be faithful until, that, maybe that trial is for me to be faithful until something dies. Mm -hmm. And if mm. I'm faithful unto death, mm. then I won't be harmed mm -hmm. by the second mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. Because I would have gone through mm. the process <laughs> For God to do everything that he needed to do my Lord. in my life, my Lord. in that circumstance, my Lord. in that relationship, yes. where, whatever it is. Yes, yes. So much so that I have gotten, if yeah. you will, yeah. what God wanted me to get yes. out of that yes. situation. And he has been glorified. Says that a man who bows to Christ has no need to bow to anything yeah. else. Yeah. A man who has surrendered to God has no need to surrender, surrender. to anything else. Yeah. If Christ is your victory, then there can be no defeat. Yeah. And that's why we got to can be no defeat. We got to stop crying over some things that yeah. that are dying in yeah. our lives because yes. that's yes. part of the process. Yes. Yes. That's part of yes. where God is taking us. Yes. We've got to see if any man lack wisdom. Let him ask of let God. Let him ask of God. Yes. Maybe God, show me what do you want me to 
to see in this yeah, situation? Yeah, what do you want me to yeah, learn? Yeah. Reveal to me your will yeah, in this situation. Yeah. It says, if you ask God mm. for wisdom, he gives it liberally and, and he won't scold you, mm -mm, scold you for mm -mm, asking for it. Mm -mm. He will give us the mm -mm, wisdom that we need mm -mm, and the circumstances mm -mm. that he's called Every us to. Every single time. He will. The beauty of this, and we're done, the beauty of this is that the promise for the believer is he's protected. Yeah. He's covered. And the grace of God rests over his life where nothing shall by any means nothing. even hurt him. We worry for no reason. We fret mm. for no reason. Our Father has already won the victory. We are overcomers. We are more than <laughs> conquerors. There is nothing that can by any means harm us. Yeah. He will not be hurt. Man, I yes, love sir. this. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you all so much for joining with us. I hope that you have been blessed by what you've heard. Um, we certainly have. I have, <laughs> so, indeed. There is something about the Word of God. Whenever you, when you open it and you read it and you see the truth in it, it has the power to bring change to your life. I want to encourage you that if you have shied away from reading this book, if you have thought that this book is not relevant to your life or you've been afraid of reading it, there's nothing that we've said in these last two weeks that have brought about any fear if you are a true child of God. If nothing more, it is to encourage the believer it is to give the believer more confidence, yes. more faith, to know that your faith is resting in a great and a powerful God. This, this, this text that we saw tonight and what we'll be seeing over the next several weeks, it keeps saying, he that overcomes, he that overcomes, yeah. he that overcomes. What that says to you and me is that we're going to overcome. We are. Yes, sir. You are going to overcome. Yes. I am going to overcome. Yes. So don't let the trials of this earthly life cause you any distress be not dismayed whatever be time yeah god will take care of you yeah. he promises in his word that he will cover you and nothing shall by any means harm you you will not be hurt that's, right. that's the promise of our god read the book read revelation but don't read it out of fear no, read sir. it out of promise Read it out of faith. Read it in confidence. Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Father. I honor you, God, yes. for your great word towards us, that you have given us the power to power. overcome. Mm. Even what the enemy seeks to do when he comes to cast us into prison, when he comes to cast us away from the culture and society, yes. To ostracize us, to laugh at us, to ridicule us, to make yes. fun of us, to make us a laughing stock to the yes. world. God. I thank you, thank God, God, that you have this life under your power yes. and in your control. And nothing oh, happens outside nothing. of your realm of control. Mm. So, Lord, we surrender to you. Surrender, we give you our life. Yes. We give you our heart. We give you everything that everything. we have. We declare that you are our champion yes. and our victor. You're the one who fights yes. our battles and you go before us. There's nothing the enemy can do or ever will do that could ever be strong enough to pull yes. us out of the grasp of your hand. Lord, we are covered by your covered. grace, protected by your protected. power. So God, let your light shine upon these who are listening and watching right now. Yes. Let the glory of the Lord rest the upon them. May they have no fear. May no they fear. have no intimidation. No intimidation. May they never shrink back at never. the troubles and trials that may come their way. Yes. Give them a strong yes. faith that will be able to stand against the wows of the devil. Yes, God. We'll be careful to give you praise and to give you glory and honor for it. Oh, God, we are overcomers. We are overcomers. In Jesus' name, we are Jesus. more than conquerors. Yeah. In Jesus' name. And every believer said hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And amen yes. again. Yes. 
Dr. Beasley. It is well, Pastor. Yes, sir. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Yes, sir. It is well. It is well. We ought to walk in the joy of the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I love you, sir. I love you, sir. I love you very God much. Thank you. you for being Thank a you part. For, Thank you for being study. our pastor. Thank you, sir. And teaching. Thank you, sir. Leading and guiding us it's in the Word of honor. God. It's our honor. It's our honor. Thank love you. you. Love you. All right, guys. Well, I want you to. Be here Sunday. Don't miss Sunday. It's going to be a blessing for you on Sunday. And let's get ready for our fast. We're going to be fasting. And please don't miss this. Fasting the entire month of January. So start now preparing for the fast. All right. God bless. I love you much. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. Bye-bye.